Please welcome the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Welcome to the opening celebration of the 2022 Library of Congress National Book Festival. Yes. <laughs> the theme of this year's festival is Books Bring Us Together. And after three years since we last gathered here, and after two virtual festivals, the theme is so, so fitting because we are finally back together in person. <laughs> this is the National Book Festival's 22nd year, and it remains one of the preeminent literary events in the United States. It's also central to the library's mission to expand our reach and connect with all Americans. We want to share its rich collection of treasures, and we hope to inspire and energize the next generation of thinkers and artists, students, public service, and more to continue to tell the American story and our collective history. As the largest, As the largest library in the world, we also have the opportunity to champion reading and literacy. And so this weekend, we're bringing together an acclaimed, diverse group of authors and illustrators to our nation's capital to celebrate books and the essential place they have in our lives. We do this for the benefit of thousands of book lovers who come in person and those who will participate virtually. Now, I have a guess that all of you watching and right here are book lovers. <laughs> and you know how just a single book can change a life, how books unlike life, unlock life's wonders and how they teach us to live and flourish. And so tonight we're excited to hear from five of our distinguished National Book Festival authors those who write and illustrate books, they change our lives in ways both profound and everlasting. And assembled in this auditorium tonight is an extraordinary gathering of talents. But before we begin, we have many to thank. First and foremost, the United States Congress, the library's chief benefactor since it was established in 1800. No library in history has enjoyed such long lasting and generous public support. Without private sector support, however, there would not be a National Book Festival. Our most generous supporter is festival co-chairman, Mr. David M. Rubenstein. I have often heard David speak of his belief that books and reading are keys to the success in life. As many of you know, we share a history at the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, which was David's library growing up. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> David has never forgotten the seminal role libraries played in his life, and he demonstrates that through his support of the Library of Congress, and David, we are most grateful. We are also so thankful to all of our sponsors who make the festival possible. Our charter sponsors, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, The Washington Post. Yeah. 
our patron sponsors, AARP, General Motors, the James Madison Council, the John W. Kluge Center, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And our many friends, media partners, and exhibitors. The National Book Festival is we think the very best free event in the nation's capital. And it is possible because of you. Thank all of you. I also, though, want to give a special thanks to AARP, who has sponsored this special evening. They have been an important partner for more than 20 years, supporting the National Book Festival, the Gershwin Prize for Popular Song, and numerous library exhibitions. Most importantly, AARP is the founding corporate sponsor of the Veterans History Project, the library's initiative to collect and preserve firsthand interviews of U.S. military veterans from World War I through the present, the largest oral history project of its kind. AARP CEO, Joanne Jenkins is with us tonight, and we thank you. And yes, it really does take a village to put this festival on. So I want to acknowledge the more than 1,000 volunteers, most especially the Junior League of Washington, which is supported the festival since 2003, the hundreds of volunteers from the general public, and of course, the very hardworking staff of the Library of Congress. I want to take this opportunity to, to introduce the library's new literary director, Clay Smith, who has a distinguished career managing book festivals across the nation, including the Texas Book Festival and working with First Lady Laura Bush during the genesis of the National Book Festival. So you'll be seeing a lot of him at the festival tomorrow and at the LOC event. But now, Clay, where are you, Clay? There he is. And so now, it is my honor to welcome to the stage the chair of the library's James Madison Council and the co-chair of the 2022 National Book Festival, Mr. David Rubenstein. How many people have not been to the National Book Festival before? Anybody here? Oh, wow. How many people have not been to the Library of Congress building before? Okay. How many people haven't been to the Coolidge Auditorium before? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, just everybody that's been here before, just think about something else for a minute. Um, <laughs> the Congress of the United States, in its wisdom, decided that it would be good if they had a library. And uh, that was an idea actually proposed when we had the Articles of Confederation. And it was an idea proposed by James Madison. And uh, typical Congress, they move slowly. So about, uh, about 12 years later or so, they finally got around to doing it. It was legislation signed when John Adams was president in uh, 1800. And uh, what happened was uh, they allocated $5,000 to purchase uh, few hundred books, I think it was 300 books and maybe four maps or something like that. And that was the entire Library of Congress. Um, what happened was uh, it grew a little bit and as the Congress moved down here, the Library of Congress was in the uh, building of uh, the Congress and that's where it was. And uh, when the British came in 1814 to sack Washington DC, they burned the Library of Congress. 
along with the Congress. So the books were gone. That's when Thomas Jefferson said, well, I'll sell you my library, which he did. Uh, he needed the money, and, and uh, the deal was done. And he sold it for roughly $24,000, I think it was. And that became the Library of Congress. Uh, those books were later burned in another fire. But, <laughs> but the Library of Congress has done a very good job of, of getting reproductions, and, we, and some of them still exist of the original ones. And ultimately, the Library of Congress grew and grew and grew. And so it is uh, now, it was decided in the late 1800s, it would be good to have its own building. And this building was built in 1897 for $10 million under budget and on schedule. Uh, it was redone, uh, I think, around 2000 or so for roughly $150 million. Um, but I think the Library of Congress has two of the most beautiful rooms in Washington, D.C. Uh, you were in uh, one of them just a little while ago, the Great Hall, and some of you may have seen the main reading room. And those are two spectacular buildings. Nothing like it really is in, exists in Washington, D.C. And the Library of Congress is appointed by the uh, President of the United States, even though it's called the Library of Congress. And uh, there have been a number of Library of Congresses, but there's only been one woman who has served as the Library of Congress, and there's only been one African American who served as the Library of Congress. <laughs> and for more than 50 years, there wasn't anybody who was actually a librarian who was actually the Library of Congress. So, in Carla Hayden, who has uh, come from my hometown of Baltimore, we have the first African-American, first woman, and first professional librarian in 50 years, and she's done a spectacular job. So, uh, she is celebrating, she'll shortly have to finish her sixth year, it's a 10-year term, can be renewed, um, and uh, no doubt, I'm, I'm sure there will be a great outcry of of uh, outcry if she, her, she is not renewed. She's done a spectacular job in so many things, uh, including the National Book Festival. Now, um, the National Book Festival, for those who don't know about it, um, it wasn't James Madison who thought it was a great idea. He didn't put it in the Constitution. And Thomas Jefferson, for whom this building is named, uh, didn't think of it in the Declaration of Independence either. So where did it come from? It wasn't the Constitution. It wasn't the Declaration. Uh, nobody really uh, thought about it at the time we were creating the country. So what happened was uh, when George W. Bush was elected President of the United States, um, during the inaugural ceremonies, um, the li then Library of Congress, the predecessor to Carla, uh, Jim Billington, who served for 28 years as the Library of Congress, he was at a reception right before the inauguration, and, uh, and Laura Bush, who a librarian, uh, said to, to Jim Billington, uh, we have a book festival in Texas, do you have one in Washington? And he said, drinking very clear, quickly on his feet, we will. <laughs> and, um, and so that began the first National Book Festival. It was on the Mall, for those who may remember. Did anybody remember the National Book Festival on the Mall? So it was, it was quite something. Uh, you had to worry about the weather, and it rained from time to time, and there was a lot of dust, and there was a lot of people from the uh, National Park Service saying we're ruining the lawns and so forth. So eventually, they kind of said, well, maybe you're ruining this lawn permanently, and, and uh, we didn't worry when the weather to kind of interfere with it. So ultimately, uh, we were able to get the uh, Washington, D.C. government to let us use the, um, the convention center, which if you haven't been to it, and you haven't been to the book festival, you may not have been to the, the, the convention center, it's one of the things that is right amazing in, in terms of its size. So tomorrow, uh, we will have between 150 and 200,000 people at this book festival. And uh, it's an incredible uh, uh, number of people that come. They come from all over the United States. And the last time we had it in, in person, in 2019, um, people were camping out at 4 a.m. in the morning to get in. Uh, and that was in part because uh, one of the features then was uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was to be interviewed. And she was interviewed uh, then by uh, Nina Totenberg. And uh, at that time, there were about roughly 10,000 people that came to that interview. And of course, it was live streamed as well. And there, it's, it's incredible uh, to see that many people who care about reading and books that much. And it's, and it's incredible to me, as, as Carla said, I came from very modest circumstances. And in, in my family, we didn't have enough money to go out and buy books. And, and so I was dependent on the, on the uh, public library, like many of you probably were. And in Baltimore at the time, you could borrow, if you were six years old and you got your library card, you could take out 10 books a week but you can only take out 10 that week. So I would take out the 10 on a, like a Saturday, read them on a Saturday, and I had to wait a week to get them the 10 books. Um, but it, was, it began my love of reading, and I've often thought that 
uh, what could be more pleasurable than sitting down and just reading a book? And, and, and reading is great, uh, but reading a book is even better because when you read a book, you have to concentrate your mind, you have to focus your mind, and it really does so much to make people a better, uh, enjoy humanity better. And think about it, what separates all of us as, as, as members of, of the of human species from all the other species on the face of the earth? We now know that other species can communicate with each other, but they can't really produce anything in written form that is for somebody else to read. And so it's one of the things that separates us from all the other species on the face of the earth. We actually know how to write and we know how to read. Now sadly, many of our fellow Americans don't read as much as they should and maybe because they can't read that much. The latest uh, Department of Education statistics say that, and this is hard to believe, but 54% of people between the ages of 16 and 71 cannot read past a sixth grade level. And it also turns out that more than 25% of Americans have not read a book in the last year or been to a bookstore in the last year. So while all, all of us are uh, book groupies, no doubt, and we're Library of Congress groupies, sadly, many Americans don't read very much anymore. And if they read anything, it's a tweet, uh, not a, a, a book. You know, I often wonder, would William Shakespeare have been able to write those plays if he had to deal with responding to tweets? Or maybe he just would have tweeted things and not written those plays. So whether tweets are good or not, uh, it's, it's incredible when you think about the, the, the level of intellect that's, that it takes to write a book and the level of intellect it now takes to, to read some books. And sadly, many of our fellow Americans don't read books very much anymore. One of the people that inspired me to really get involved with doing more in history was David McCullough. Now, David McCullough uh, is an extraordinary individual, and he wrote two uh, books that won the Pulitzer Prize, the book on Harry Truman and the book on John Adams, but he wrote so many other great history books, and he was the personification of a great historian and a great writer, and he looked like, like what you would expect a great American to look like. He had the great white hair, he had this great voice, and he came here many, many times, and he did a lot of his research here, and at the dialogues program that we have with, for members of Congress where we we talk about American history and we interview historians. David was there several times and I interviewed him. And I've interviewed him on other occasions as well. And he was an incredible person. And let me just tell you one story about him. Uh, Jackie Mars over here um, helped put together a um, effort to raise money for the Great American Prairie, which is designed to save land out west. And the first award is named after Ken Burns. And the first award was given to David McCullough. And so it's a big award and uh, comes with a lot of uh, uh, I think an honorarium, a very considerable honorarium. And so David uh, got the award. He was there in front of several hundred, several, he said several thousand people. And he got up there and he didn't talk at all about himself. He never talked about himself. He talked about his wife, Rosalie, who sadly passed away about two months before David did. And his wife of some 67 years, I think it was, had a unique style with David. What David would do is he would write the books He'd write the, he'd write the uh, a paragraph, and then Rosalie would read it. And he'd read it back then to make sure it not only read well, but it sounded well. And so that's how they did all those books. He would write a couple paragraphs, give it to her, she would read it back to him, and they'd go back and forth. And he told a story at that night when he talked about only about his wife. Um, he talked about a time that he was writing a book which later won the Pulitzer Prize. I think it was the book on John Adams. And he wrote a, uh, a line... Uh, he wrote a paragraph and Rosalie read it back to him and uh, he said it sounds okay and she said no this one sentence doesn't really work he said read it again read it again uh, that's okay no it really doesn't work that sentence is not good it's okay he said I really think it's not not so good she said god damn it put it in there let's go on to the next thing that was it so the book comes out, it wins the Pulitzer Prize, and before it gets the Pulitzer Prize, there's a review in the New York Times by Gore Vidal. And Gore Vidal said, this is a spectacular book. I love everything except there's one sentence in that book <laughs> that shouldn't be there. Uh, David was a great humanitarian. He gave an uh, enormous amount of his time and energy to our country, and it's a, really a, a loss uh, for our country that we don't have someone uh, like David uh, anymore, um, and um, you know, I regard it as a personal loss as well. He became a friend of mine, and we have a little video that I'd like uh, people to watch right now, if you would. Uh, 
I have been devoting my working life to the American story for over 50 years. And I'm, I'm ever grateful that I somehow had the good fortune to wander in the, into this way of life, contributing what I can to the betterment of our country. I've done this on paper, I've done it in classrooms, I've done it on television and on the stage and in every way I can to convey that history isn't about boring statistics and quotations and memorizing dates. It isn't about just politics and the military. History is human. It is, it is about people. When in the course of human events our declaration begins. So, um, we, will, we will certainly miss David, and he was a great friend of the Library of Congress and a great friend of mine. Um, tomorrow, uh, for those who are going to be there, and I hope all of you will be, it's an incredible event. You'll see, um, as I say, about 120 some authors signing books, reading from their books, um, and ans answering questions about their books. And what we've done uh, tonight is we have five authors who are going to talk a little bit about the books that they have written recently. And I, I think uh, they are the real stars of the book festival, the, the, um, the authors. But I just want to just thank again the sponsors who've made this possible and thank all of you who are here for making this possible because without you, obviously, the book festival wouldn't be a success. But I know everybody here is a lover of books and I hope you'll love what we have for you uh, tomorrow. And I want to thank Carla Hayden again for getting it all organized. Thank you all. Thank you, David. David McCullough was truly an American treasure, and he will be greatly missed here at the Library of Congress. He'll always be part of the festival's legacy and history, and we honor him tonight by continuing the tradition with tonight's author program. The authors you'll hear reflect the depth, the breadth, and diversity of our lineup this year, speaking to topics of today and appealing to readers of all ages and backgrounds. Please enjoy. Please welcome Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, and associate editor of the Washington Post, David Moranis. I never correct anybody, but it is Moranis. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I knew I was following a great benefactor. I didn't know I was following a comedian as well. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, I'm thrilled to be here uh, tonight to honor librarians, the librarian of Congress, books, writers, history, and the search for truth, all of which are way too vulnerable in these times. In 1911 and 1912, there was a young teacher at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School teaching business classes named Mary Ann Moore. And she loved sports, and she'd often watch the athletes there perform. And of one of them she wrote, he had a kind of ease in his gait that's hard to describe, equilibrium with no stricture, but couched in football, he was the epitome of concentration, weary with an effect of plenty and reserve. That was before Marianne Moore became one of the great poets of America. She started at the Carlisle School, and she was talking about Jim Thorpe, one of her students from the Sac and Fox Nation of what would become Oklahoma. He was at the boarding school on his way to becoming the greatest athlete America and perhaps the world has ever seen. You know, it's hard to compare athletes from different generations because of training and diet and equipment, but Jim Thorpe did things that are unparalleled. He was not only a decathlete and pentathlete gold medalist, 
at the Stockholm Games in 1912. He was an All-American football player for two seasons, and he was a Major League Baseball player. He could do anything. He was also a great ballroom dancer, and they said he was great at marbles. <laughs> and it all began at the Carlisle Boarding School with its legacy of glory and cruelty, an, Ill an institution that perfectly illuminates the American story in all its self-absorption, duplicity, and misunderstanding. That boarding school was founded in 1879, only three years after the Battle of the Little Bighorn in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, for the express purpose of forcibly trying to turn American Indians into white people. The, the motto was, kill the Indian, save the man. That meant take away their religion, their language, their culture, shear their braids, dress them in the uniforms of the US Cavalry, try to take away everything that was their own culture which makes what happened on September 9th, 1912 so poignant with meaning. It was just a football game, but more than that, the Carlisle Indians against the Army on the plain at West Point. Two of the best teams in the nation then. On one team, the All-American left halfback, Jim Thorpe. On the other, a linebacker named Dwight David Eisenhower. Soldiers on one side, Indians on the other. And Scott Momaday, the Native American novelist and playwright, said it was like reinventing history. There was something in the air that day, he said, something made of omens and prophecies. Some old imbalance was being set right. Unlike their fathers and grandfathers, they were given an honest chance on the field at West Point, competing against the sons and grandsons of men who had devastated their people on the frontier. They were simply grateful to play on a level field. Jim Thorpe was magnificent that day. Dwight Eisenhower limped off the field with a bum knee. The Carlisle Indians won 27 to six, and it was perhaps the greatest act of athletic retribution in American history. It was also the culmination also of the greatest single year of any athlete in history. Before that football season, Thorpe had competed and won those two gold medals at the 1912 Summer Olympics in Stockholm trouncing the field in 15 events that involved the pentathlon and the decathlon. But only two months after that football game at West Point, those medals were taken away from him for unjust reasons, as my book documents. He played baseball in the Eastern Carolina League for two summers at a time when literally scores of college athletes were doing the same thing. Most of them were playing under aliases. Dwight Eisenhower played under the name Wilson in the Kansas State League. There were so many aliases in the Eastern Carolina League where Jim Thorpe played that they called it the Pocahontas League because everybody was named John Smith. <laughs> Jim Thorpe played under the name Jim Thorpe. But when it was revealed that he had played there, the medals were taken away, and it was only this July, 112 years later, that justice was done and those records and medals were destroyed, were restored. 112 years too late. And that's only part of the story of the electric life of Jim Thorpe, a path lit by lightning. Thank you. Please welcome Please welcome best-selling historian and author, Candace Millard. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here, to be in the Library of Congress, which is a national treasure, to be with the Librarian of Congress, who is a national treasure, and to be with all of you. Thank you for having me. One of the great regrets of my life happened at the National Book Festival 11 years ago. It was the first time I had been invited to the festival, so I was really excited, and it was still in the mall at that time, under this stunning series of big, beautiful tents, one for history, humor, fiction, 
poetry, every category. And then there was an author's tent where authors could hang out. So after my event, I went into that tent and I was talking with one of the volunteers and she asked me if there are any authors I'd like to meet. And I'm pretty shy, so I was about to say no thank you. But just then I looked up and I saw David McCullough. And I'll never forget it, you couldn't miss him. He was tall, straight backed, white haired, elegant, smiling. So before I could chicken out, I said yes, is there any chance I could meet David McCullough? Like many, many people, I had long admired McCullough's writing. I had read his books for an enjoyment. I had read them to try to understand how he wrote them, to try to learn from them. And I wanted to thank him for that. But the real reason I wanted to meet him was because his work had helped me through one of the most difficult times in my life. Six years earlier, when I was finishing work on my first book, I had had a child who was born with stage four neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma is a common childhood cancer, but it's extremely rare to find it in utero. And unfortunately, even though we had found it so early, it had already spread to the baby's liver. She was given a 30% chance of survival, and we started down this road, which would last for two years. Eight rounds of chemo, multiple surgeries, and a lot of nights in hospital rooms, sleepless and scared. The only escape I had, the only thing that helped at all, was books. At night, my husband was home with our older daughter. My baby was asleep in a crib, hooked up to machines and monitors. And I sat in a corner of her room with a pen light and a pile of books. And I realized that, along with all the other magical things they do for us, books give us one more gift. They remind us that we are not alone. My sister sent me some books to take with me to the hospital, books that I will always love and be grateful for. But I also took a few of my own, and one of them was The Great Bridge by David McCullough. It's a big book, as all of his were, but it's a page turner, and it was exactly what I needed. For just an hour or two, every night, to forget. To forget and to remember. To remember that this might be hard, this might be scary, but there are a lot of things in life that are scary, and you just have to be brave, or at least pretend like you are. So fast forward six years and I'm standing in front of David McCullough at the National Book Festival. And my daughter is a healthy, silly six-year-old. <laughs> and I have a chance to thank someone who is not only my hero, but who, although he could not have known it, helped me through this very difficult time. But instead of telling him that, telling him what his books had meant to me, I froze. He was so kind and gracious that I was just nervous and starstruck, and I couldn't do it. And I never did. I never told him. And I have regretted it ever since. No day more than the day just a few weeks ago that I heard that he had died. But I can learn from my mistakes, especially when given another chance. This is another National Book Festival and another rare opportunity to thank the people I admire, whose work has inspired and educated me, broken my heart, and given me hope. So if you'll indulge me, I would like to tell you what your books, your poetry, your histories, your novels, your illustrations, your words of advice and comfort have meant to me. They are essential, they are irreplaceable. They are what makes us human, what lets us understand each other. They make us better than we were before we picked them up. And I am deeply grateful for them and for you. So if you ever have one of those days, which we all have, when you think that no one is listening, no one is paying attention, no one cares what you're creating, remember this, you're wrong. There is always someone on the other end. They might be in a library or in an office cubicle, on a farm or in a hospital room with a sick child. It doesn't matter because for that person, 
your work is a lifeline. So as a grateful reader, I thank you, and I thank David McCullough. I'm only sorry I didn't say it sooner. Thank you very much. Please welcome actor, best-selling author, and expert woodworker, Nick Offerman. Thank you. Uh, if you're on TV and you can make a table, you run the risk of being called an expert woodworker. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm aspiring. <laughs> I'm sincerely honored to be here in the company of such talented writers uh, and to be part of this menu. We've had erudition and eloquence, and now you get me. <laughs> uh, we're really lucky to be enjoying the incredible hospitality of the Library of Congress. Um, I've been most edified to discover that it is an actual library building, <laughs> the biggest in the world, in fact, uh, thanks to the founding vision of some of our early presidents. Uh, to quote the library's website, Jefferson's belief <laughs> in the power of knowledge and the direct link between knowledge and democracy has shaped the library's philosophy. And after reading of this link between knowledge and democracy, um, I just wanted to make sure that all the members of Congress are aware that they can access this library. <laughs> uh, that, um, do they have that in the, in the starter pack? <laughs> My life uh, has been inescapably shaped by libraries and books and the knowledge they hold. My high school librarian, Miss Kinsella, helped me select my audition pieces for my first theater school audition at the University of Illinois in 1988. Good news, uh, I got in. My family currently boasts three librarians and a couple of school teachers, and they are considered the most admirable family members by far. <laughs> uh, second only to our brother, uh, who wears an even more heroic hat as a purveyor of craft beers. With such fealty paid to books in our family, imagine my surprise and theirs when I transitioned from reader to author, allowing me to share both with them and the readership I've been fortunate enough to cultivate my love of the things that are the most important to me, the outdoors, working with my hands, the legendary seven delicious meats, um, <laughs> and fidelity, fidelity to my bride. The most rewarding and edifying example of these literary bounties is my very fortunate fellowship with my favorite author. Some 26 years ago, I read my first short stories by Kentucky farmer and author Wendell Berry, who was awarded the 2010 Humanities Medal by President Obama. I was rather swept away by the agrarian ethos in which all his writing is couched. And I was working as a theater actor and a carpenter at the time, and his themes really appealed to the laborer in me. If you're unfamiliar, his work lends a sense of nobility to the working class, especially to the farmers and the other stewards of Mother Nature's creation who do their best to provide us with the raw materials we need to live in a way that is also sustainable year in and year out, ideally forever. Agrarianism. Sexy. <laughs> uh, 
That's showbiz. <laughs> Mr. Berry also enumerates the ways in which the so-called progress of our industrial civilization is pitted directly in opposition to the agrarians he tends to make his protagonists. And he does it all with humor and affection in a way that caused me to immediately write him a letter and ask him if I could please adapt one of his stories to the stage or the screen. Good news, he wrote me back. Bad news is he said no. Um, <laughs> But I have kept bugging him over the years, auditioning different tap dances on his porch, uh, until, good news, I was finally able to befriend him and his family and share some, some meals and some good work. And now I am delighted to stand here before you tonight and tell you that he still hasn't changed his mind. <laughs> He did, however, give me a bit of homework when I described my new book to him. He asked me, at least I, I think he asked me, although I don't recall him using any question marks, um, to compare the nature philosophy of John Muir to that of the Wisconsin agrarian Aldo Leopold. Now what he turned out to mean was when talking about nature and conservation, to take our national gaze from the distant beauty of places like Yosemite or the Grand Canyon, the locales championed by park angel John Muir, and turn that gaze right here to the actual creation of Mother Nature in which we live every day, to steal some of that urgency from the way we think about protecting our publicly held lands with its flora and fauna and beautiful landscapes and give that urgency to our home places, our local watersheds. Aldo Leopold suggested that we employ a land ethic, a notion that expands the definition of community to include not only us humans, but all the other parts of nature as well, soils, waters, plants and animals, or what he simply called the land. In Leopold's vision, you can't care for the people without also caring for the land. Now, some more good news. I was then able to travel to gorgeous and remote national park lands and to humble farm operations in the US and in England, not to mention a COVID protocol Thanksgiving with my very own family in their Illinois backyard to prepare the best report that I could muster for Wendell and also for my readers. A book eventually titled, Where the Deer and the Antelope Play. And I'm grateful for that opportunity to continue the conversation about how we are using our planet's resources for good or not, especially with regard to who is providing our food and how. I think uh, we absolutely have it in our power to get our land ethic right, but the big question remains, as always, will we? If we do, it'll be largely thanks to incredible authors like the ones featured in this festival, and the fact that I am counted among their illustrious number leads me to say it must have been a very slow year. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please welcome award-winning author of more than 50 books for young readers, Andrea Davis Pinckney. Thank you, Nick. Good evening, beautiful people. The best way to say, come along, children, don't you be weary, is through the pages of a book. Child, do you feel it? Do you truly know that stories play a rhythm all their own? Of course you do, and so do I. Because as the author of more than 50 books for children and young adults, 
as a parent and as someone who travels widely through states and nations, here's what I witness from Brooklyn to Denver to Accra to Johnson City, Tennessee, to right here in Washington, D.C., where I was born into a family of civil rights foot soldiers who marched with Dr. King and who welcomed me with hopeful arms when I arrived in an inner city hospital not far from this great hall. Today, when I'm on the road, here are the young people I meet. The first grader has hungry eyes. He speaks no English, but he wants to learn to read. He says, me gustan los libros. I like books. Yes, his eyes are longing for something wonderful. When he receives a free book as part of a subsidized literacy program, he hugs it like a pillow. Gracias, he exclaims, muchas gracias. His excitement needs no translation. And I am thinking, you little one are my apple pie. You, like a book, bring us together. The shy teenage girl approaches me, timid but with an open face and an open heart, wide, wide open. Her teacher introduces us. The girl's name is Hanifa. Hanifa is ready for a story to be poured into her wide, wide openness. But first, she shares her story with me. It's a poem she's written herself. Dare I respond in the little bit of Arabic I know? Shukran, Hanifa, shukran, thank you. Thank you. Hanifa, you are my butterfly, taking flight on the beauty of your very own wings. Shukran, Hanifa, thank you. You, like a book, bring us together. The teenager with pierced ears, a nose ring, and hint of a goatee, living out loud in lemon jello high tops, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about, uh-huh. He knows he's cute. Did I mention that he's fluent in American Sign Language? He shows me how the deaf express gratitude. Little boy Q, so proud to live out loud, you are my rainbow. You are my pretty prism of multicolored letters that spell pride and joy. You so beautiful, filled with wonder, and like the magical ride of a merry-go-round, we sing again. Let's go around again. Yes, again. Let's take another joy ride, like in our favorite book. Let's rejoice over and over, no price to the ticket, because, you see, reading is free freedom. You, little boy Q, free freedom. You, kid, like so many books, bring us together. Here's another young person I've met in my travels. 10-year-old Ty Bree Thaw, a determined kid from Johnson, Tennessee, reads a book and learns all he can about Congressman John Lewis and his heroic march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in the fight for voting rights. Determined to meet his hero, Ty Bree takes hold of a dream that sets a miracle in motion. Ty Bree's two grandmothers take him on the seven-hour drive to Selma, Alabama, on the off chance that their grandson might meet Congressman John. When they arrive with thousands of people who also have the same idea, the son's fingertips reach down to point Ty Bree in the right direction. John Lewis picks Ty Bree out from the crowd, and so begins a remarkable friendship. 
when I learn of this, I am thinking, you, Ty Bree, are the chosen one. You and your modern activism can show us the way. Through you and so many kids, we will all rise on the wings of Wade in the water. We will all work our way up, 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 straight to the soul of lift every voice and sing, and I have a dream, and Black Lives Matter. Here we go, soaring through book pages that fill us with an undeniable flutter. Lifting us to the windows and mirrors of Coretta's vision, swinging open the front door and holding an open seat at the front of the bus to give us a good view of Rosa's determination. Carrying us on the shoulders of John Lewis's invitation, yes, y'all, let's get in to good trouble. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where our kids come in. Apple pie, butterfly, rainbow, determined Tybri from Tennessee. You are turning the pages on history. And now I'd like to close with a short excerpt from Because of You, John Lewis, the book that celebrates the friendship between Tybri Faw and the congressman, and is illustrated with the evocative paintings of New York Times award-winning artist, Keith Henry Brown. Here's the excerpt. When heaven's cloak called John Lewis home, when the world said goodbye to the crusader named Good Trouble, Tybri Faw stepped up, stood tall, spoke spoke about courage, spoke about strength, spoke about the determination of moving past doubt. Ty Bree from Tennessee, he knew. Because of you, John Lewis, we shall not be moved. Because of you, John, we can all look to the sky. You've given every child permission to fly. <gasps> Do you see it up there, the wide, wide blue? Because of you, and you, and you, we will lace new shoes, cross big bridges, wake up, wish, and march toward a brighter tomorrow. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in applauding 14-year-old Ty Bree Faw from Johnson City, Tennessee, the subject of the book, Because of You, John Lewis, who is here tonight, with his two grandmothers, Ty Bree, please rise so that we can acknowledge you. Thank you. Please welcome the Pulitzer Prize winning science writer, Ed Young. to imagine that there is an elephant on the stage next to me. This is not a fancy metaphor. I really want you to imagine an elephant. <laughs> don't, ima don't think about why it's here, how it got here. Those are all details. Just work with me. There's an elephant. Imagine also that there is a dog, a bat, a robin, a rattlesnake, and a mosquito, because it's DC. There's always a mosquito. <laughs> All of these creatures would be sharing the same physical space as me, but each of us would have a radically different experience of that space. The elephant and the dog would see that flag as yellow, white, and blue. The elephant would be able to hear 
infrasonic sounds too low for my ears, while the bat and the dog would hear ultrasonic sounds too high for me to hear. If we switched off the lights in this room, the rattlesnake would still be able to find the other animals by the body heat that they gave off because it can see in infrared. The robin would be able to point in exactly the right direction it needed to go in order to migrate because it can read the magnetic field of the Earth itself and use that to guide its migrations even when no other landmarks are obvious to it. To the uh, dog, the room would be rife with odors, with swirling, wafting scents that it could detect and that I would be oblivious to, but that the elephant and perhaps even the rattlesnake with its tongue might be able to pick up. And the mosquito would be able to scent, smell the scent of carbon dioxide wafting from my breath and use that to home in for a bite. I hate mosquitoes. Even when animals exist in the same space, they have very, very different realities. They are, each creature is trapped within its own sensory bubble, within its own world of sights, smells, sounds, and textures that it is privy to and that others might not be able to um, even detect. There is a beautiful word for these sensory bubbles. It is umwelt comes from the German for environment, but it doesn't mean the physical environment. It's not the podium in front of me, the floor underneath my feet. It is the sensory environment, that unique cocktail of stimuli and information that each animal is privy to. And the thing about the Umwelt is that it is always partial. It, each creature is only, um, can only access a thin sliver of this immense world a small slice of the fullness of reality. And for that reason, I think that the Umwelt concept is one of the most beautiful and most wondrous in all of nature. It is inherently humbling. It tells us that despite our vaunted intelligence as humans, our experience of the world is incomplete. It certainly doesn't feel that way. Our senses create this very powerful illusion that we are perceiving all there is to perceive, but that is very much an illusion, and it is one that we share with all other creatures. There is so much around us, colors, electric fields, magnetic fields, that we do not tap into and that other animals can. And I think that by considering those other senses, the, um, um, the Umwelt concept makes us see the world in a more expansive way. By thinking about it, we understand animals um, in, uh, in their own right. We understand the incredible things that they are capable of. A dolphin swimming through the water can um, sense its surroundings through echolocation, a biological form of sonar, which also allows it to peer into living tissue. A dolphin is essentially a living medical scanner. It could sense the skeleton inside you if you were diving next to it. Even more familiar creatures are extraordinary in their own right. Whenever I go, whenever I go for a walk with my dog in the morning, I always pass sparrows and starlings, two of the most common urban birds around. Each of these creatures can see an entire dimension of colors that I cannot see. They can hear qualities in their own songs that my ears are too slow to perceive. They can feel the movements of air blowing over their wings as they fly, and as they move, their eyes are so placed that their visual, that they um, can see behind them too. So while my visual world always moves towards me as I walk, a bird always moves towards it and away from it at the same time something that I do not experience and struggle to imagine. By thinking about the experiences of these other creatures, we also see our own world in new and wondrous and frankly, quite trippy ways. To a bird, paper isn't white. To a cod, a fish swimming in the Arctic Ocean, ice isn't cold. When we think about this, um, uh, the umwelten of other animals, we understand that bird song isn't meant for our ears, it is meant for the ears of other birds, which can pick out those qualities that we can't hear. We understand that the colors of flowers that we find so beautiful were not, have not evolved to tickle our eyes, but to specifically delight the eyes of pollinating insects, which can see markings and uh, colors and patterns on those blooms that are oblivious to us. To a bee, a sunflower is not obvious, it's not uniformly yellow, but has a blazing ultraviolet bullseye at its center. When I walk my dog, his name is Typo, great writer name. 
When I walk Typo in the morning, I watch him sniff his way along our neighborhoods, stopping for minutes at a time to examine a plant or a bit of sidewalk that I would have walked by oblivious. When I consider the world through his nose, I understand that even the most mundane parts of my existence are full of change, full of hidden delights. And this is one of the things I want people to take away from an immense world, the books that I've just written. A sense of the magical and the mundane, the extraordinary and the ordinary flickers of the fantastic and the familiar. The book is a tribute to the necessity of curiosity and of empathy, of trying to take the perspectives of lives that are very, very different to ours. This is a theme that runs through much of my writing, including when I'm not writing about the senses of the other animals, of other animals, uh, the COVID pandemic. I have spent much of this week and certainly all of today interviewing and writing about people who have been disabled by the persistent symptoms of long COVID. One of the most common symptoms of this condition is brain fog, a term that in no way captures the debilitating nature of what it is like to have your most fundamental cognitive skills stripped away from you. Brain fog is not a hangover, it is not anxiety or depression, it is not psychosomatic. It is very specifically in the disorder of executive function, the set of skills that includes focusing attention, holding bits of information in your mind, and blocking out distractors. Those skills are so foundational that without them, much of normal life becomes impossible, including reading. And one of the most common things that I hear from people who have this symptom badly is that they can no longer read. So when we think about all the things that we're going to hear during this wondrous festival, when we move about these spaces in the coming days, I urge you to extend the full force of your empathy to people who have had very different experiences of the last two years, people for whom there is no normal to return to, people who can, do not get to move past the pandemic. I urge you to think about in the face of all of the rhetoric of individual responsibility that we always hear, our collective responsibilities to each other, and way, the things that we still need to do to stop more people from losing this immense source of joy that we all get to take part in. Thank you. Thank you to all of our extraordinary presenters, to all of the distinguished authors in the audience, and to our sponsors. I hope you have had a wonderful time tonight, and please enjoy the festival tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.